Well, Jeff Lutz, since I sent you over kind of a rough idea what we're going to talk about today, we've got some breaking news, and that is that 12.3.4 is rolling out wide, and Whole Mars has already tested it, and he says it was absolutely perfect, not even a single note. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, the the pace of releases uh, tells me that um, in some ways you could, you could view it as is, is the, is the platform stable or is it destabilizing because there's so many releases. And I would say it's actually stabilizing that the fact that, you know, they can reach a fleet of potentially up to a million vehicles uh, this quickly and, and understand, you know, there's different hardware versions and so forth. So just from my background, this speaks to the fact that they're just on a completely different paradigm now, and uh, they're 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 solving problems rapidly, and they've got a very stable platform where they can go in. They're they're you know the the, the training's improving, it's updating, and and they can just make these mo minor modifications and hit the fleet pretty widely. So it just seems to me like they're on a whole new kind of pace. It's a it's a new paradigm and it's a new pace. And I think we, I think that's one of the key takeaways is we can't be kind of thinking on our old like V11, V10 type paradigms of very small rate of improvement over a large span of time. It looks like there's going to be large, you know, swaths or large jumps of improvement in short periods of time. Yeah. And Elon said that this was going to happen. So they obviously knew in advance that whatever they were doing was going to allow them to make these kind of major uh, and these are not insignificant changes. They've a lot of stuff has been pretty pretty serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there and there's there's still features that are major features that are going in as well. So it's exciting. Can't wait to get it myself. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So whenever uh, we get close to earnings, one of the things that starts going on in my mind is okay. What do I want to hear? What do I want to know? What will I hope that they get? That they ask the Elon or the other members of the of the executive team. Um, so, um, but I already know what I'm thinking. I'm curious what you would ask if you had a chance to be on the uh, one of the reporters <laughs> on the earnings call. Yeah, I would. Um, I the the I would ask them. You know, it, it it looks like it looks like he's setting the company up for this major transition from being a auto, like 97% of revenues are, you know, from auto. And it's on this path for a, a major transition where a larger percentage of revenues that could sw completely swallow the current hardware revenues um, will become from software as a service. So walk us through that transition. Are there key dates that you could, um, or key dates or in, in milestones and or milestones that you can put out for the team that that would help better help us understand like the roadmap going forward. Um, Cause right now it's everything's just been kind of like, it's open. Like there's no guidance on the right now in the business. Um, and, 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 but it looks like since they had the Ju January earnings call to now, like they've really accelerated this transition of the company. So yeah. I, if I already, if I only had like 30 seconds to get a question out, like it looks like, the company's undergoing this significant transition to software as a services company. Can you help articulate, you know, milestones and any key dates that we should be looking out for besides 88 and the robo taxi unveil? Yeah. All right. And we, and we don't even know yet what that robo taxi unveil even means. We don't know right. if it's hardware, if it's uh, an app, we don't know if it's both. Uh, we don't know if it's going to actually roll out in terms of the existing owners of vehicles quickly after that date to uh, turn their vehicles into, into robo taxis. Uh, do you have a quick uh, thought on what you think that is going to mean? Well, I would hope the date, um, when you say that you're going to unveil a robo taxi, you should be able to show the robo taxi. You should be able to show the hardware and you should be able to demo the full solution, the full, everything, the app, um, like, and I, we were, I was on a space with Larry and I think he had a, a brilliant point about, you know, this thing should, you know, drive itself up on stage, you know, and, you know, like there should be, you know, dem demos of this actually working now, are there going to be 
vehicles and supply ready to, to launch? Probably not. Um, but then there should be some, there should be some, you know, clarity about that and relative in dates and so forth. And if I'm Tesla and I have all these assets on, if I'm Elon Musk and I have all these assets under my control, whether it's XAI or whether it's so, what could I do to a robo? I've already disrupted the business model for a robo taxi because I'm going to build a robo taxi at a lower price point than anybody can build it. Okay. I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have training hardware bigger than anybody else out there that has it, that that's doing anything like this. But what could I do for consumers that no one else could offer based, you know, and based on all the assets I have. Mm -hmm. So is it a grok experience inside of the car? Is it, you know, so hopefully there's some, like there's some plus ones in that uh, unveil that they really show like, this isn't just another robo taxi. This is, this is very special. This, this can be, you know, this could be global. This can really scale. Um, you know, anyway, so I think what's the special, what, 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 what makes Tesla special at this and be very, very specific about it. Okay. Now we're going to give you, we're, you're going to get a big surprise. You get a second question at the earnings call, not just one doesn't even have to be a follow-up. What would be your second thing? On that your would have been my, that oh, would have been um, my question, which would be is there are a lot of different robo taxi services okay. out there. Please describe in detail why the Tesla solution is needed is better. Yeah. You know, and are there any surprises or anything that we should be thinking about in terms of unique things that Tesla can bring to this that no one else can. Okay. So as we switch to a software type company, do you have hardware company, hardware questions that you would still love to have answered? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I would like for them to reiterate what their, um, you know, and I would put it all in context, like, you know, the growth of EV, like the growth of any new um, category, um, doesn't always go up in a perfect line. So what do you see happening today? How do you see it? And it's, you know, how do, I want to, I would want to ask the question in a way where, cause I know he, he was asked this question um, in the, in the podcast recently with the Norwegian um, pension fund of like, he, and he says, I think EV adoption is going great. And it's in every car is going to be EV is what he said. Mm -hmm. So what I would try to get down to is like, do you think Tesla's role has changed in this? Do you think anything has changed uh, from a unit volume perspective kind of longer term? And do you think anything has happened to the auto industry that, that could be kind of permanent, whether it's, you know, the TAM, is the, is the TAM permanently reset, for example? Because I think we had peak TAM maybe in 2017. And, um, and the, now there's a bunch of capacity out there. So is there anything that's changed um, in your mind relative to when you did master plan, you know, two or three. Right, right. So what about questions about the factories? I feel like uh, the rollout of factories, has, I mean, even though he's going to India, et cetera, but I feel like the rollout of the factories is ground to a halt. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 uh, and I have a very, very different take on this. Um, I, I view the the casual or very highly interested Tesla investor that is counting factories, uh, it's it's a very crude metric. So if it's going well and just factories keep opening, I think you can take some solace in that, but you could also really put yourself into an overcapacity situation very quickly and have a major cost problem on your hands. So the question I would have is, around around the factory piece is again is something fundamentally changed with the tam and the ev segment mm -hmm. or the way people use vehicles will be using vehicles in the future that cause you to readjust or rethink your factory footprint and have along the way of you if you developing this unbox model have you have you come across um, innovation that allows you to basically get so much more output per square meter that you don't need all these factories. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Yeah, that could be, that could be a piece of it, huh? Yeah. 
I uh-huh. believe that's what's, I believe, see these things in my opinion, and then from, from building factories internationally and, 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 and being responsible for this, it's not a direct linear relationship of like the TAM goes up, my market share is going up and therefore I'm, I need more factories. It's like, you have to be thinking of like, how do I become more efficient? How do I, you know, how can I do things in, in, in multiple dimensions inside of this, you know, like, you, you have to figure out a way, fundamentally a way to, to be transformative and, and that output per square meter has got to improve annually or or by release of, of of each factory generationally. Otherwise, if you're not doing things fundamentally differently, then at some point someone's going to leapfrog you. Um, so I think that's what's happening. I think Tesla is actually, I, I think Tesla is leapfrogging themselves. I think they made a huge leap when they did the, the dual casting and I think they're going to make a huge leap with the unbox model. And I think some of these original factory plans of like, I need a hundred gigafactory you know, or whatever, whatever the number is. Um, I think they may be outdoing themselves in terms of their, their factory development process and their manufacturing development process. And um, they just don't need as much foot as, as, as high a footprint as they may have needed. We'll see. Yeah, in fact, you just gave me this crazy idea. We haven't seen anything in terms of uh, a plan for a gigafactory, an additional gigafactory in uh, Shanghai. You're a factory builder. I've never done that. I've just moved into existing facilities. Would they be able to go up in the existing factory there? Would they be able to, you know, section by section, uh, go to five floors instead of the current two? I- whatever it is? I think, well, um, it depends on, it depends on what you're, you're doing. There's certain things you, you, you can't do at higher elevation. Um, but it, so it, 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 it depends. The answer, short answer is it depends. Yeah, right. I, but they have land in Shanghai that they've already commissioned for oh. this. So there is a valid question on the table, which is like, you're supposed to be building out a bot operation in Nevada. You're supposed to be, there's some things that they're supposed to be, be doing. Yeah, you know, in, in existing sites where they have existing, they have an existing factory. So, how are those expansions going? Is there anything you can comment on those? Because it looked like the Nevada one, like there isn't, like there isn't progress happening. Right. Um, the Mexico one, I could see being tied into the fact that, um, um, that they're going to honestly ramp ramp this out of out of Austin. But I, I still think that they're going to do. I still think they 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 plan to do a Mexico facility. I also think that they want to kind of feel out what's happening politically too. Uh, yeah. Um, so I think there's a number of things happening, um, on that front. I think they're going to do the next generation vehicle in every existing site except Fremont. Except Fremont. Okay. So you believe they will do a drivable? I'm sorry, a consumer version of the next gen version of vehicle in all of the plants, including China. The platform, meaning that that platform Ah, could be a consumer driven vehicle. It could be a robo taxi. It could be a van. Um, I believe that they're, that they're facilitized. They're doing a next phase in Berlin and in Austin. Uh, I believe that, you know, Mexico they're, they're, they still plan to do that. And then, um, and then if they do, you know, they're going to probably going to announce an Indian operation. Um, and then in Shanghai eventually as well, I believe in all the existing auto operations that they're going to add a phase and they're going to do the next gen platform. Okay. I think all those were kicked off in, in 23 for 25 readiness, I believe. Okay. All right. Do you have any more questions? I mean, I bet you do. If you sat down and thought about it, you probably have a hundred questions. I know I have questions about batteries and other things, but what? Uh, I, do you have any other? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would want to understand. Well, yeah, what is there? Um, b- besides, you know, cell output. You know, and besides, you know, the like the, the 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 answers are are very kind of like we're not the tallest tent pole kind of answers uh, on batteries, but are we, when are we going to reach escape velocity on the 4680 output? So you can basically, you know, be unencumbered on any vehicle platform, any, any platform line. I would want to get into the model three um, issue a bit just to understand it. Like, is this in, is this endemic is like, is there something going on 
um, because it's a fairly big unit volume miss in in North America. Like it looks like you had the de- you have the demand for this product line. Yeah. Uh, it looks like you cut the old product line off at one point when you weren't ready for the new one. Yeah. How did that happen? And is this is this going to be extensive or, or did you fix this problem already at the end of Q1 and it's just going to catch up in Q2 and, and be, is supply going to, when is supply going to reach demand on the model three? Right, 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 right. Okay. Well, let's take a, let's take a quick uh, look over at the other big news of the day, which was, uh, you know, we, uh, we've uh, had a, a really, uh, Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I had one more story for Tesla before we get there. I, maybe even two. <laughs> so UBS had as a neutral rating on Tesla. This is the latest uh, rating to come out with a price target of $160 a share. Well, we should be able to make that. Uh, they forecast Tesla will only deliver 1.88 million this year. That one is crazy, but only a little lower than you know the possibility in my mind. But they only have a 2.7 million, 2.07 million in 2025, which is crazy. Um, and uh, yeah. So uh, what do you think about UBS's <laughs> and the other? Well, downgrades that are- there's a, I mean, first off, there's been a, a conga line of downgrades for the last 30 to 45 days. Um, m- mostly in the last, fi- I would say the last 15 to 30 is where they've been concentrated. And, it, you know, it coincided with the, the, the P and D uh, product production delivery. Right. And so there's a lot of, analysts that just Tesla hasn't given visibility of like, okay, well, what's, what's the plan now? So all analysts are doing is they're taking Q1 and they're, they're basically extrapolating it through the end of the year and then going into their spreadsheet, doing math and take the Tesla on the earnings call and specifically Elon needs to, and and I'm not telling them how to run their company, by the way, I've never been one of the people, but in order to answer this question, for all these analysts downgrading the stock, they either Tesla either will not care or they will want to convince these analysts of like, this is our transition plan to a software as a services company. And yes, this is, you know, where we see, you know, units for the rest of the year, we're going to be in very low growth mode uh, for the rest of this year. However, this other component of our business is going to grow rapidly. And, you know, we think you should be paying attention to it. And I think, you know, again, more articulate that path. Like what is Tesla seeing internally that has them so convinced that they can do a robo taxi unveil on 8.8? Maybe walk through some of that without obviously giving in any, any way, anything secret. But yeah, that's what's happening. These, uh, these downgrades happen in clusters. They usually, they downgrade too late and then they upgrade too late when they're on the upswing. And, you know, Tesla's already, um, ahead of it but yeah so they're just they're looking at q1 numbers and they're extrapolating it so there's probably going to be more analysts between now and then going into the earnings print and then um the scary thing about the earnings print is like um you know because elon's talked about how much compute they're procuring right um you know is there you know are we going to get into a cash flow situation tesla has plenty of cash um but you know is there going to be okay then if if we get into a negative cash flow situation, then the next question is going to be is like, well, is this going to grow into the second quarter? And how many quarters of negative, I'm, I'm giving a scenario, but how many negative quarters would you have? Or how many zero, you know, free cash flow quarters would you have? So these are all the things that, that could come up from this. Um, and again, it goes back to Tesla articulating their path. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then I also, just before we went on the air, uh, Tesla Model 3 is the fifth most searched used car in the world. And Model Y is number 21. Even the X and the S are in the top 50. That might suggest that there's more demand out there than people realize if you've got that kind of activity in the used car market. Yeah. I don't know the, the right ratios for that because the, the the Model the Model 3 was the number one selling EV until the Model Y knocked it off. So, you know, it so it's been in market two or three years longer right. than the Model Y. So there may be a clear reason for that. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, Tesla, you know, has a has a decent market share. Now they're shipping a couple million, basically at the rate of a couple million cars. So they're going to start breaking into those top lists, whether they're EV or not. It's not surprising. Um it's not surprising to me. I think if 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 FSD becomes 
kind of has a real magical moment of, you know, major adoption, then yeah, you could see that used car thing spike up even a lot further because that's the way people can get access to Teslas that even you can get a model. There's model threes out there for 20 grand with FSD. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine uh, somebody who's forward thinking might be going, you know what, I think I'm going to grab a few of these model threes for my fleet. Uh, so that when RoboTaxi becomes a thing, I've got a $20,000 vehicle. Uh, so I'm going to make money hand over fist on that one. All right. I'll <laughs> grab five of them. Yeah, exactly. So that, exactly. that could, um, that could happen. Um, so we'll see. And you also, but I mean, on the negative side of that, you, you do have fleet operations like Hertz putting a lot of them out there too. So um, there's a lot of, they're, put, they're, they're creating a lot of inventory of used threes as well. I, th I think if I was 20 years younger, I would probably be buying some of those because I, I, you know, I famously have Turo'd some of my cars in the past. So this would be right up my alley. In fact, I, I owned a used car rental car business for a few years back when I was a, a mere child. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. If we look at the economy. So the obvious elephant in the room was uh, inflation and interest rates. And you posted today, structural inflation supply chain deglobalization, CHIPS Act, Inflation Reduction Act, student loan forgiveness, and record yearly deficit spending are not designed to or aligned with 2% inflation. Choices, reconsider the target rate or stop spending. So yep. would you like to illuminate, would you like to give us some color on your statement? Well, first off, as it relates to Tesla, Tesla you know, was under pressure today because you know, the 10 year went up, what, 19, I mean, went yes. up 19 points. It's at four five, six. So Tesla is a, they're, they're out of that mode of being a negative uh, earnings company. They used to be in that bucket of a, an interest rate sensitive company and, and, and being in, and being sensitive to the fact that they needed to go to the capital markets for funding. Right. They solved that problem. They have an amazing balance sheet but they're still an interest rate sensitive company. So the interest rate shooting up like that put pressure on the stock today sure. um, significantly. So that, that connection should be, should be told. I mean um, so yeah, everything core and, and, and uh, headline CPI came in a point higher. I think we're going to get a uh, so 10th higher. I think we're going to get PPI is it tomorrow. Yep. Um, so, you know, these are the inputs to the PCE and the PCE is what the fed uses. So, and CPI is the big biggest portion of, of the PCE. So, you know, when you look at the data and every, anybody can go out and do a Google search and look at the different components. And um, it looks like, um, you know, there's some stickiness with services like, you know, insurance and um, home health care, things like that, that are, you know, that are staying around longer than people forecasted. And, and then, and these lag on effects of, yeah, cause, cause uh, the, because the price of vehicles did that ramp up. And then there was this lag of the insurance, you know, rates, you know, costs going up, um, that that's staying on uh, a lot longer than people anticipated long, long story short, the way that, you know, the markets looked at is, is, is like, is the fed going to be able to cut the, they were on three cuts and now they're down to two cuts or one cut this year. Yeah. And that plays with the market psychologically. And that's why we had the sell-off we had today. There was a little bit of a bounce back, but not too much. Right. Um, Cause there's, we're in a bull market and you can tell you're in a bull market is when you have these big issues, um, you usually have some buying that comes in and there was, um, and then you had people shifting and they went, now they're going to sources of, uh, you know, kind of strength, you know, like Nvidia turned into like a, a fairly decent, you know, people are shifting to that. And, and this, oh, just companies that are just not, it's a, it's an AI play. So people are like, well, AI is going to grow regardless of what's happening with interest rates. So this is the, I, I would say this, this print, everybody was writing off January and February. This one appears to be like, there are signs that reinflation could, could be happening. And that's why I wrote that tweet of like, you just can't keep doing all. I just saw today that they, they allocated 6.6 .6 billion for TSMC. I'm all for like, I'm all for reshoring and doing this stuff. It's just, it's just going to be inflationary. So if your target's 2%, but you're, you're doing this kind of, you know, spend, 
Like the two just don't, it's going to cost more money, by the way, too, for silicon to be done here. Uh, because right now we actually don't have a, uh, nobody's thought through the supply chain node yet. Like auto, a U.S. auto will be able to take silicon. That's great. But they're not, these new silicon plants aren't building 15, 20 nanometer si size chips. They're building, you know, two to, to five nanometer size chips. So that's going to be for the next full self-driving computer. That's going to be mostly for data center. Um, and a lot of that, um, a, a lot of that assembly and a lot of that construction of those products are not here. Um, so, and again, outside of, uh, of Tesla and, and their full self-driving computer, um, a lot of those endpoints are not here. So anyway, supply chain deglobalization is, is going to help countries be more resilient, especially as there's ge these geographical shifts or there could be wars or whatever, but it's going to cost more money in some, in some cases. Yeah. Uh, until these, until you have the AI piece ramp up, until you have the automation pieces ramp up, which they haven't really fully ramped up yet, these things are going to cost more in the near term. Yeah. So CNBC says Supercore accelerated to a 4.8% pace. Actually, quite frankly, all of them were at 4.8. So the headline number, the core, and the Supercore were all at 4.8%. But it isn't just. No, four eight. They were a point four percent. So that is a that is an annualized rate of four point eight, right? Am I doing something oh, wrong? Oh, I, I thought I thought the um, I thought the the core was CPI 4. was a three it was a three eight, oh. and then the headline CPI was a three uh, five. No, that was the actual year over year. I'm talking about the oh. annualized. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. And, that's, yeah. and the annualized right now at four point eight is not just this month and last month, it's actually now three months that it's been averaging at that number. So yeah. anyway, but going on with the CNBC story, they're saying, okay, Supercore is at 4.8 pace a year over, um, oh, that's even year over year. I'm sorry, that's even year over year, which yeah. is the highest in 11 months, not just in the three months. Tom Fitzpatrick, Managing Director of Global Market Insights at RJ O'Brien and Associates said, if you take the readings of the last three months and annualize them, you're looking at a super core inflation rate of more than 8%, far from the Federal Reserve's 2% goal. Today, he added the picture is more complicated because some of the most stubborn components of the services inflation are household necessities, as you just mentioned, like car and auto, I mean, car and housing insurance, as well as property taxes. And, you know, this raises one of the questions, Jeff, that I keep wondering about. I'm sure the Fed's not stupid. <laughs> These guys are, even if they're wrong, they're not stupid. Um, the car insurance thing is not going to change until it does change. So in 2025, these rates are going to come down like crazy because this is, the, the insurance companies are making many hand over fist. I heard reports this morning. Their, their free cash flow is off the charts. They're making more money than anybody expected them to do. Why? Because they got the insurance commissioners to raise their rates this year based on last year's crazy uh, amounts that they were having to spend for both new cars, used cars, and parts. And now that all goes away this year. So they're making a fortune. Well, those commissioners are going to force them to lower their prices next year. So January, February, March of next year might look really good. But between now and the end of the year, it's it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, and and, and this is, yeah, the these types of things, you know, these structural things that are in place. Uh, but it looks like, like, you know, there's there's other other areas that are of concern too. Food. It's not. It wasn't just one or two areas. Those are the top areas. Right. There's a couple other areas. Then it just gets complicated with fuel ramping up again. Yep. And the price of oil and just all these things coming together. It's not like you can just cleanly segregate it and say it's this one thing or this other thing. Uh, and then, you know, consumption still seems to be strong. But what is disinflationary is what's happening on the jobs front. Like the quits rate has gone down. The number of job openings have come down. Right. The wage growth has come down. Like those are all disinflationary signs. Mm -hmm. The Fed's going to look at those things. Um, I believe like they're going to look at like, those are disinflationary signs. They just have to eventually convert themselves into the job market statistics for, for whatever reason, we still get 
these amazing, you know, these amazing job numbers, and then they get restated a couple months later. Um, so it's just going to have to make its way into the job numbers, but the, the fed doesn't want the jobs market to crack and then they make a move. They want to get ahead of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the Riggs report, that's what he calls himself on, uh, on X, the at Riggs report says that the 10 year bond auction was horrific today. He yeah. tells, he tells the big money show, we may have a problem financing our debt if people aren't buying treasuries at a 4.5 or higher yield. Jamie Dimon said we might be going to 8% interest rates the other day. If inflation really is at 5% or 4.8%, that would be a reasonable rate, not 8%. Well, yeah, even 7.5%, 7, 7.5% treasuries would be pretty normal if we're looking at a 5% uh, inflation rate. Uh, what do you think? I think that would be a, a big problem. Uh, and we don't want to see it. We have to watch the metals and, and to see if if those start taking off as well. That's an, also not a very good um, sign. So that's copper another is, thing to... Copper has been up uh, every day except today for about eight days in a row, nine days in a row. Significantly up. Yeah. It is up 25% so, in 30 days. Yeah. This is the problem. So you're, I mean, who knows what the PPI is going to have because there's lagging effects and so forth, but you have a hot PPI too, you know, you're going to have a hot PCE Yes. and, you know, and there we're, we're off to, we're off to the races again. So we, we have to be careful. Um, so, so the question is, is I, I think the fed knows that they have to they have to, to start cutting because these lagging effects are there. The question is, and they know they're there, They and they can see what's happening in the job market right. under the headline statistics. So it feels like there's a functioning economy where there, you can still have job growth and inflation at least wasn't ramping out of X. You know, So now, so now the, I think the worst case scenario is the job market starts crumbling, but then inflation is, can, is continuing to ramp and then they become out of sync. And then you don't have that soft landing scenario. So this, I think, I don't, I don't want to kind of like over rotate on one month, but January and February were hot, a little hot, yeah. but not like outrageous, but they were definitely uh, up. So it, it's not one month of data. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Fed reacts. So it's, so let's see, maybe we get a good PCE, who knows, um, but it's kind of feels like wishful thinking. Yeah, I would say that, that sounds definitely like wishful thinking. And of course, you know, the other side of the, the this whole situation, as, I, as I've talked about on this channel before, I'm sure you have too, is some of the things that the Fed is the most worried about are not under their control. Yeah. The oil prices, gasoline prices. I mean, yes, to a certain extent, if you slow down the economy, people buy less gasoline, but gasoline is an international commodity. Uh, they're really not in control of housing pricing. In fact, it's kind of the opposite right now is that yeah. if they lowered rates, they'd put more inventory out there. Um, rents, I don't think they're going to be able to do much about rents right now. All of the additional capacity is in the system already. Um, so, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to slow down what has already been slowed down. So the, the, these, these uh, builders in the multifamily business have already, they already get it. They're going to have to slow down. <laughs> so that's not going to change. Um, so I'm not sure somebody asked, I saw a headline today. I didn't read the whole article, but the headline was, does the fed really have any tools left in its tool chest for this circumstance? To raise rates, raise rates. That's their, that's their, that's their, that's what they got. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that's the tool. I mean, they could tighten, they could mess with credit and then you cause another problem, right. With, um, Cash. and they kind of are already wary of that. Right. Um, but the, the tools they have are quantitative, you know, they can, the money supply and, and, uh, the rates. Yeah. So yeah. they've left themselves plenty of room to raise them, yeah. to alleviate rates and to alleviate their, their tightening on the money supply. But now, yeah, it's more of like, do you have to start going in the other direction? I don't think they're, I don't think they're there, um, I don't at this point, but you know, again, it's not like these numbers were outrageous. Um, and, and it was in a, a few specific categories. Um, but I, I would say it's, it, it, you know, if you're on the home team and, and if you're on team disinflation, this was not a, a, good, not good, a good, good, good output. 
Well, so the other side of the thing that we watch, of course, in terms of the stock market, in terms of the economy, is how are earnings going? And a lot of my emphasis in this channel has always been about productivity. I'm sure you're a, I think we've talked about it before, you're a big productivity yeah. guy. Um, so we're going into the earnings season with very lofty expectations. I've been listening to a lot of reporting on that today. Um, but now we have the headwinds of inflation and interest rates and small business confidence was not good. The report yesterday, uh, the Tuesday, yeah, yesterday, from the uh, Federal uh, the Federation of Independent Businesses, they came in not uh, not very uh, positive, not uh, not not having optimism for the next uh, few months. So, um, do you think that the earnings that are going to come in are going to be strong enough to keep us from a sell off, or do you think we're after this thirty percent increase in the S and P? Do you think uh, we could be looking at a 10% drop. No, I, I actually think the earnings are going to come in strong. Um, and I, I think, I think it, I think if company companies are kind of looking, you know, for the next quarter, I actually think, um, the guidance is going to be, but it's going to be dependent on the, you know, which, which companies I think, um, I, I don't know if the bank earnings are going to be so hot. We'll see. They're, they're going to be the ones that start first. Yeah. Um, Friday. but I, I think, I think big tech, I think ad advertising, I think, um, I think those earnings are going to come in and they're going to be fairly strong. Obviously we know Tesla's are going to be under duress. Um, but, and I think, I, I don't think all the Mac seven are going to come in and be strong, but I think most of them, um, should do okay. At least those were the, that's what the projections are. And again, it looks like, you know, consumption, uh, it doesn't look like there's any drop off in, in retail sales. So a lot of these companies that are, you know, they're either in retail or they're building product for retail should be, you know, doing well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a strange thing because, you know, the job market's been going strong and people are spending. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. As long as people get those wages, they're going to, yeah. they're certainly going to spend them. Costco came in today for their March sales, 9% up. So, uh, you know, they, that was certainly stronger than probably. That's a, that's a big bellwether. A big number. <laughs> so, all right, well, let's take a look at what we can see about what's actually going on in the markets, Jeff, unless you have anything yeah. else. Maybe you no. have something else that's burning in your heart that you just feel that you need to talk about. Uh, no, I just think we're in a, a, a very, um, this is a really important time for, for, for Tesla, for the markets. Um, and, but again, I, Tesla has products that people want. And it's what uh, one of the, the biggest things I think people miss from the first quarter is I don't want to sugarcoat it. Um, like there was a miss, there's definitely a miss in expectations versus expectations. But if Tesla could have produced 50,000 more cyber trucks, they would have sold. If they oh. could have produced 50,000 more model threes, they would have all been sold. Like, so to say that they have a demand problem, you know, it, there, there's, there's, there's data when companies don't have the product line, uh, to be able to meet, you know, it's when they have the product line, they're just, they're, they have to get it ramped up and get into production. It sounds like, like an excuse. It isn't because there are companies in a position right now where they honestly, their inventories are, are, are growing and they don't have the product line that people want. And those are the ones where that, that is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, kind of situation. I just think Tesla is the products that people want, and we're not. And then we have this whole other component to their business that they're going to to ramp up with. And I think people, this other component, this is the, the thing that people are struggling to get their minds wrapped around. Like, how is this actually going to work, and how is it actually going to unfold? And I, I think it's it's not going to be super clean, um, but it's it's I th I think it's once it's up and it's fully functional, and it's at scale me in the software as a services business, I, I just think it's going to be extremely powerful. And, you know, whatever you put on the, you know, what do people value per mile driven? Uh -huh. um, even if it was down to a penny or two, it's it's going to be way bigger than the, you know, the auto businesses today. So anyway, I think that's what's on people's mind today. Is there a demand problem? Uh, and again, they did miss the quarter. I do think part of it was demand, part of it was execution, part of it was these supply disruptions. And um, 
And then the second thing is how does this co company transition to being a software company? I think those are the, to me, the big burning things out there. Yeah. And I don't want to sugarcoat it either, but the only demand problem, if there is a demand problem was the best selling car in the world, which is also in a category that is never the best selling car in the world in terms of the yeah. price point. And so sometimes you're going to get up against some kind of barrier to how you can move that much metal in that price point. So, and of course I've mentioned, I think you and I even discussed it maybe last week is, and it is now the least technical of the, of the, middle the middle price cars the the model three and the ct the cybertruck are both way more technically advanced so there could be a little bit of uh of um of cannibalization taking place mm -hmm. yeah all right tesla 84 cents negative in the after hours so so 512 during the regular uh day i think i think there's a, a kind of a, a shelf at 170 169 there seems to be you know, quite a bit of resistance every time it gets down to that level. I actually, yeah. I actually felt like Tesla held up really well this last week, given the bad news that they've been dealing with. Now, they've had some good news too. So the good news, I think, in this is has actually given them a lot of resilience. Well, they actually thrived. I mean, they're you know in the last, you know, except for you know obviously today, the last you know five days, it was up you know two percent. If you you know, net out today is probably up three, four, you know, percent. So they actually thrived in the last uh, five days. So yeah, it was definitely antithetical to the 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 P and D results. And that again, that's you know, there's a lot of excitement around um, you know the company in this transition. So, yeah. so the and also like you know, it took it took you know, it was down thirty percent you know year to date. So yeah. the, the question on the table was was some of this baked in already. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, you and I, I think, talked about that about three yeah. weeks ago. Um, the 10-year is actually down 1.4 basis points in the pre-market, So, but it's still at 4.546. So that's a big, healthy number. Um, do we go to four? Do we, do we go back to five? Um, you know, if, 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 boy, if you get a hot PPI number, you know, you could certainly push up to four, seven pretty quickly. And then you're you know, now you're dealing with technicals too. So, yeah, you could you could. I, there's a lot of resistance out there too, um, but you could. So yeah, there need to be some some good data points coming out, or you know, this this could, and this is going to put a lot of pressure on Tesla. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, let's look at oil. I know it had popped back up again. Uh, everybody's giving a bunch of excuses and reasons for why that's well. Okay, so we're. We're even in the pre-market or pretty close to even, but Brent is back up over 90 and uh, Texas Intermediate, 86.31. Um, some of this is, of course, the international, you know, goings on in Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Now today, so I, I don't know if you saw this the other day, but there's uh, some issues in the southern, in West Texas oil that they can't sell off their natural gas because it's too cheap. So that's that's causing them to, reduce production. Then later today, I heard that Mexico is also reducing their exports by 300,000 uh, barrels a day. They want to go inside. Their, their numbers are down. Their production numbers are down, and they want to become self-sufficient in oil. Um, and so they're going to reduce the amount that they're exporting. Now, typically, that is a that just balances out in terms of the international market. Right. It doesn't matter whether they're exporting it or not. But it was certainly kind of as a headline potentially cause a little bit of pressure, um, you know, to the upside. So we have a lot of pressure to the upside. I don't see much pressure to the downside. Yeah, and markets are jittery right now too. So they're they're kind of looking for any any excuse. Um, so um, yeah, there's there's it it seems like it wants to you know the the jump over ninety and and stay up there for a bit. So. So I'll have to see. There'd have to be something happening from a macro perspective that would want to want to drive that down. Um, but right now, it looks yeah. like it's you know it's up there for a bit. Natural gas actually finally taking a breather, down one point three eight percent in the pre market at a what a dollar eighty six. Now that is a these are this is still a very low number. Those. Uh, uh, West Texas uh, drillers, what they want is they wanted it at 250. 
That's the perfect number for them, I guess. So it's still well under that number, but uh, it has been going up pretty much all, well, late last week and all this week, uh, but taking a breather today. Um, gold up another 370. <laughs> so I'm claiming that this is all about Costco, you know, selling those gold bars. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, 2,352. Anyway, copper uh, actually took a little breather also, but still sitting at $4.27. So it is still way up there uh, compared to where it was much earlier. It was 355 in October and now at 427. So that's that's a big jump in the copper business. Dollar surged to a 34-year high against the yen today. Wow. 34 year high. <laughs> That's partially the yen's fault, though. It's not 100% the dollar being so strong. The yen is under pressure. Um, Bitcoin up 1,639 at 70,567. It'll change in a second. Um, anyway, it's all over the place. Yeah. It's all over the place. Yeah. It's just up and down and up and down. Seeming like a uh, range now, maybe 66,000 to 73,000 seems to be. Seems to be range bound a little bit now. Have you seen that, or is that? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So I, it's interesting how it, it even it kind of it went down with the with the CPI number, which I thought was interesting. They never covered, um, right? And it, and it did pretty well throughout. So I don't know if, if are people rushing to, to Bitcoin. It looks like Ethereum's up a uh, percent too. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how how it's being valued. All right. And then in the equities, you've got the Dow down 93, another 0.25%. You've got the S&P also down 0.25%, 1350. And the NASDAQ down, look at that, 0.23, very, very close on all three, down 3950. So the equities continuing to sell off. And that would suggest that that's where we'll open in the morning. But of course, that's not a 100% not a true, but that's kind of how it usually works. The good thing about the Nasdaq, it was down more than double um, today, and it it recovered a bit. Um, I think um, the Dow recovered a little bit, but not as much as the yeah the the Nasdaq was down. No, oh, maybe not. Yeah, almost almost double. What the what the Dow was. Sorry, the Nasdaq was down almost double where it closed at. So it, it kind of it did did a little bit of a recovery, but the Dow not so much, but a little gotcha. bit. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Interesting. Three buyers right. out there. Well, as usual, there was a Scott Walter video on earlier today that I want to remind people to go take a look at because again, I guess I did something wrong with the thumbnail, Jeff. I don't know what I did wrong, but it's not getting nearly as many as Scott usually gets. So I'm putting up. <laughs> I'm putting up a card right there. So I understand that you have a hard cutoff. I think I did it. I think I got us under it. Yeah, we're good. And we're good. All right. So thank you, Jeff, as always, for bringing in the good news. What was the good news today? Uh, the good news is we're transitioning into a world yeah. of SAAS over at Tesla. So we always, yeah. we always have to identify what the good news was. <laughs> On a day like today, we need to identify. Yeah, red day today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jeff, thank you so much. And to all thank of you. you out there, it's been great talking to you.